Okay, um, a few more thank yous this evening. This event would not be possible without our friends at the Fresno State Alumni Association, sending many thanks to Corrine Wong Stack, Donna Moreno, and Nicole Traverso, and some uh, spiritual thanks uh, to Peter Robertson. Uh, they're a tremendous team who really empower uh, Fresno State uh, alumni communities to gather and to share these kinds of experiences both on ground and online. Uh, so thank you very much to our friends tonight from the Alumni Association. Uh, I also want to make a special shout out tonight to a supporter of tonight's event, the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, uh, especially Professor Denis Borges. Uh, Denis has been a, a tremendous supporter of our alumni chapter in general, uh, but specifically tonight, uh, PBBI uh, is a supporter of this evening's event. Um, all the proceeds tonight are split equally between the writers and the chapter. Uh, the chapter's portion goes to our uh, student scholarship. And so um, Dennis and all of you as participants um, have um, contributed uh, to tonight's readers and to our scholarship. Uh, so special shouts out to uh, Portuguese Beyond Borders uh, Institute. Uh, Dennis is a, is a live wire and I love him to death because he has such an incredible a volume of programming. And uh, we're uh, really grateful that uh, he included this event um, in, in the Institute's normal programming. I'm gonna drop the link to their uh, official website there. Of course, you can find them on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, they have a radio show on Radio Multicultural. Um, they're all over the place. So thank you to Dennis and to PBBI. And um, my last little bit of thanks tonight, um, and by way of introduction, uh, is for uh, Marissa Mata, um, who I'll be turning over the screen to uh, here shortly. And I'm gonna call up her bio here so I can properly uh, introduce her. Uh, Marissa is um, a returning member to our alumni chapter. And uh, she's a Fresno writer that I've been very fortunate to know for a couple of years. Um, she is gonna be introducing tonight's speakers and again, moderating the Q&A. Uh, Marissa is a writer, artist, and educator based here in Fresno. She works across genres to engage with themes of womanhood, Latinx culture, trauma, memory, ghosts, and hauntings. Marissa recently founded the Wild Blue Zine, uh, which is inspired by the old Wild Blue Yonder nightclub of the original Fresno Poets Association readings. The Wild Blue Zine that's exclusively for Fresno writers and artists uh, you can find that on her website, marissamata.com, which I'll drop in the chat here in a moment. Uh, she holds an MFA in creative writing from Cal Arts. Uh, she just graduated with that MFA. Yay, Marissa. And is also uh, an alumna of Fresno State uh, in English literature. And uh, Marissa and I have worked for uh, uh, many years together um, on this project, the alumni chapter, but also on the Fresno Poets Archive Project. Um, and uh, she and I have an abiding love for Fresno writers of all kinds. Uh, and it's really, really thrilling for me to be able to introduce her to host this series because we're both students of Fresno writers. Uh, we're both students of folks like Chuck Moulton who founded these kinds of community-based readings. Um, and so it's a real uh, an honor and a pleasure tonight to introduce you uh, to our host, Marissa Mata. Thank you, Jefferson, for that introduction. Um, you make me sound very cool and I appreciate that a lot. Um, and thank you everybody for being here with us tonight. Um, it's going to be a great reading and I'm super excited um, because it is my first time hosting one of these readings and we have a super wonderful lineup. Um, so let's just jump into it. Um, so our first reader is Callie Camara. Um, she just graduated with her bachelor's and she'll be returning to Fresno State to begin the MFA program. She writes fiction and poetry and her writing from what I've seen of it so far um, has a very cool casual darkness to it um, and a focus on things we don't always want to pay attention to, um, namely death and other kinds of loss and grief and the way it impacts a person's psyche. Um, but she wraps it all in bright colors and vivid imagery, um, golden fields and turquoise jewels and red imperfectly shaped tomatoes. 
um, making it impossible for the reader to look away from what scares and haunts them. And it all becomes something really beautiful. So please help me welcome Callie Camara. Hello everyone. And thank you, Marissa, for that wonderful introduction. That was really beautiful how you, you spoke with me and I really appreciate it. Uh, so coming into this reading, I wasn't sure what I was going to read, but since we're all, uh, all three speakers are of Portuguese American descent, I decided to take the opportunity to kind of explore my own experiences um, as someone of Portuguese descent. And the result was a little strange. Um, you'll see why just by the, the subject matter that I chose to focus on, um, but I hope that you all enjoy it. And so I will be reading just a excerpt, like the first half of the story that I have been working on. So I'll jump right into it. It's called Inheritance. My hair is long, dark, and ugly. On my legs, on my arms, on my face, on my hands. It festers under my skin, shining through layers of translucent paleness, like a slow, creeping sickness. I cover up in winter attire, long jeans and sweaters in summertime heat, preferable to the stares I know I'll receive. Mom and dad are concerned. They wonder why I don't want to go outside and swim with my friends, why I start dressing like it's December. I can't tell them that on the first day of high school, some boy turned to his friend in the lunch line and said, her arms are so hairy. I was right in front of them. They must have known I would hear them. It keeps me up at night, wondering why. Why say that? Are my arms really that disgusting? The hair was a side effect of puberty, dad's hairy Portuguese jeans. What was I to do? Shave them like my legs? That sounds stupid. But it doesn't change the fact that when I heard those words, my mind shut down. I grabbed my Pepsi and pre-wrapped sandwich from the cashier and walked away, trying hard not to think, because thinking meant crying. I absolutely would not do that on the very first day of high school. Instead, I looked at my friend's arms during class. Carrie's skin is smooth, tan, and hairless, a perk of being Chinese. Riley's is so blonde it's invisible. Joyce's skin is too brown to tell. I wanted to be anywhere but there, in the middle of that classroom, while everyone was doing their icebreakers and talking about their quirky fun facts. Hi, my name's Andrea, and my fun fact is that I'm hairier than every other girl in this room. It's not that I never noticed my hair before that boy's comment. If you Google Portuguese stereotypes, the first thing on every list is always the women are extremely hairy. But when I went home that day, the first thing I did was throw my short sleeve top, a flattering peach color, a shirt I had specifically picked out for that day in the back of my closet and slammed the door shut, unwashed and everything. It doesn't matter and I don't intend to wear it again. I almost hate dad for passing this on to me it doesn't affect him or my brothers the way it affects me. No one cares about their bushy eyebrows or their hairy legs or their disgusting armpit forests. Eric and Vince could run down the street shirtless, chest hair on full display, and nobody would bat an eye. Mom pulls me aside after dinner and asks what's wrong. It's been three weeks of this, and you're still in this funk, she says. I tell her about the boy hoping she'll understand. She's led me this far through life. I just need to know what it is about the hair that makes me different when nothing else has changed, even though my body has. Nothing has changed. You're perfect the way you are, she says. Then why would he say something like that? Like it's disgusting. 
That's just how kids are, Mom says. She presses her lips together, accentuating the creases along her mouth. But if it makes you uncomfortable, we can always try waxing. I'm starting to notice things about my parents. Things I never noticed when I was younger and they were all knowing and perfect in my eyes. Mom has blonde hair like Riley. She doesn't know what it's like to deal with hair like mine. She doesn't know how to help me. In the PE locker room, I rest my foot on top of the bench to tie my shoelaces. I feel more exposed in this position than I've ever been in my life, wearing the school issued t-shirt and shorts. I've been too embarrassed to ask mom to buy the school sweatshirt for fear of her probing questions. She's already started taking me to her hairstylist to wax my arms each month, something I'm sure no other client pays to have done. For about two weeks, I can bare my arms to the world before the new baby hairs start growing in, as thick and black as ever. My legs are harder to cope with. I shave them every other day, but it never feels like it's enough. I drag the razor across my skin again and again until it's littered with rash burns and nicks. The faint print picks of black still hide under the protection of my own body, taunting me. I didn't get to shave this morning because I slept through my alarm. Now, as I tie my shoelaces, I notice Taylor Peters, who I've been going to school with since kindergarten, staring in my direction. It's instinct at this point, like a rabbit being stalked by a fox. I can sense when others' eyes are on me, honing in on my weaknesses. Taylor has a weird expression on her face, somewhere between pensive and disturbed when I finally look at her. I didn't have time to shave this morning, I rush to say before she can speak. I force myself to act cool as I lower my leg from the bench away from her sight. But since it's getting colder, it doesn't really matter if I shave, right? No one's gonna see my legs anyway. Taylor looks at me the way you look at a piece of dog crap left on the sidewalk. Fuck, I barely painted myself as the weirdo now. She had just stayed silent. Why are your legs all red, she asks, giving them a once over. Um, cheap razors, I reply. It's not intentional. You should probably buy some better ones, she says, and walks away. The sky is unnaturally drizzly as we make our way to the track field for the Friday mile run. It's rare that we get rain in the valley and everyone is loath to go inside. Girls run across the field, yelling to their friends as they enjoy the chill on their faces. The boys try to shove each other into the quickly softening mud. Carrie and Riley aren't in this class, so I make the trek alone fiddling with the hair tie around my wrist. The drizzle collects on my arm, clinging to the hairs that are starting to grow out. I smooth my fingers across them, slicking them down against my skin in uniform lines, stroking over and over. It's almost a comfort. I think a boy in my math class might have a crush on me. He comes over to my seat, rests his hand on my shoulder, says hi. His hand feels like crawling insects on my back. It's not that he's not cute, but his interest can't be pure. I use my long hair like a curtain to hide my face, hunch over like I'm focused on my work. I keep waiting for the inevitable punchline, the whisper behind my back in the lunch line. I can't believe you thought I have a crush on you. One day he sits down beside me, taking Carrie's absent seat. I fidget, sticking my hands under the table. I rolled my sleeves up to my elbows today to ward off the swelter of the overpowered heater. Now I'm regretting it. 
Hey, he says. Hi, I reply. I turn my back to get out of the pencil, already resolved not to look at him. I was wondering, what's that thing on your arm? Excuse me, I say, looking at him. Damn, but I'm riding on a wave of growing ire and confidence, bolstered by nights spent awake, imagining practice confrontations I never had with that kid in the lunch line all that time ago. He points at my wrist. Your bracelet, he asks, confused. Oh, I'd forgotten that existed. Feeling foolish, I hold up my arm, letting my bracelet catch the bright fluorescent lighting of the classroom. It's a small black bead bracelet with a ceramic rooster charm. The rooster's plume is a bright red, its body is sleek black, with lots of blue and green dots along its sides. It's a rooster, I say. Why a rooster? Such your zodiac sign? No, I say. Doesn't he mean Chinese calendar? God, Carrie will laugh about this later. It's a Portuguese thing. Good luck or something. My grandma gave it to me. Oh, that's cool, he says. I don't think my family has anything like that. Yeah. He keeps looking at it like he wants to say more. I wait a beat before awkwardly taking the bracelet off my wrist and offering it to him. He accepts it, letting the charm rest against his palm. It's just a rooster, I say. Yeah, but it's cool, like in a farmsy way, he says. It reminds me of my aunt and uncle. They raise lots of chickens at their house. I don't know how to tell him I'm not much of the farm type girl. I'd sooner drop dead than go outside and weed the yard, much less to go near a chicken. But I'm only one generation removed from a dairy family, thanks to dad. So I guess I can't complain. I like wearing it a lot, I offer. I honestly never noticed you wearing it before, he says. Your sleeves always covered it up. He hands the bracelet back to me. You should try showing it off more. I slip the bracelet back on my wrist, fiddling with the edge of my jacket. You think? Yeah, he says. The teacher calls for the class's attention and he throws me one last smile before returning to his seat. Talk to you later, he asks, hopefully. Yeah, I respond, feeling a little more confident. Let's talk again. And that's where I'll be stopping for now. <laughs> to make sure I stay within my time limit. Thank you all for listening to me read. Thanks, Callie. That was awesome. I, I'm just gonna say it right now. I felt very seen and I appreciated that reading a lot. Um, so our next reader is Melinda Medeiros. Um, she is currently studying creative nonfiction in the MFA program. And she's an associate editor for the Normal School and the president of the San Joaquin Literary Association. Her writing has been published or is forthcoming in the Odyssey Online the Reedley College Journal, Symmetry, and Haas, the new publication at Fresno State, um, new-ish, has it been around for like two years now, right? Someone correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, and um, her writing at its core is very, very Fresno. Um, she explores her family's relationship to the land, um, the give and take she experiences while working on the farm and growing up the granddaughter of immigrants. Um, Melinda unearths and records a personal heritage that is recognizable to so many of us here in Fresno and across the valley and across generations. And even if we have different ethnic roots, so, Please join me in welcoming 
Melinda. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I think I'm gonna forever describe my writing as very Fresno <laughs> from now on. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? All right. So thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Callie, that reading was amazing. And thank you, Sam. It's an honor to read alongside both of you tonight. A big thanks to Jefferson and the Creative Writing Alumni Chapter for inviting us all to read um, to the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute for their support and for promoting this event. Um, and to all of you who showed up to support us and the amazing things that the alumni chapter is doing for writers at Fresno State and with roots in the Central Valley. So thank you, everyone. Okay, so tonight, um, I'm gonna start by singing you a traditional Portuguese song. I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna traumatize you. Um, no, tonight I will be reading a brief excerpt from one of my essays uh, entitled Sadad. Um, in the essay, I explore my experience as a Portuguese American Feshta queen, um, rituals that connect us to cultures that are not entirely ours, and more specifically, my personal connection to my family's homeland. So and it's just a brief excerpt. If you want to read or hear more, you're just going to have to come back for more readings, or maybe just look for my book in the future. <laughs> All right, so that. So that is a feeling of longing, melancholy, desire, and nostalgia that is characteristic of the Brazilian or Portuguese temperament. It describes a deep emotional state, a yearning for a happiness that has passed or perhaps never even existed. And that's a quote from Words Beyond Translation by Celine de Costa. I first stepped foot in my grandparents' homelands when I was 16 a year before I would be crowned Beshta Queen. I traveled with family friends from LA to London, from London to Lisbon. There, I spent an evening exploring streets paved with ancient memories and politely smiling when my hosts brought me to a gorgeous old stone building that housed a two-story McDonald's. See, we have a bit of America here too. I remember hamburgers and fries served on real plates. I remember writing in an elevator the size of a coat closet. And I remember the way my stomach twisted in on itself as I flew alone from Lisbon to the island of San Miguel the next morning. For most of my life, my paternal grandparents had a vacation home in San Miguel, the largest of the nine Atlantic islands and my Avu's home island. Avu is grandfather. Many summers, my grandparents escaped from the suffocating heat of the dry Central Valley to their island home. But flights to the Azores have never been cheap, and my father's relationship with his parents had never been easy, so it took a while for me to get there. I arrived that first time to my tea limp's big smile, greeting me at the airport gates. He was my Avu's younger brother, and when I was a little girl, I had a hard time telling them apart. That day, he explained to me in heavily accented English that my grandparents had been delayed and wouldn't arrive until the following day. He then brought me to a woman, Louisa's house, for my first night there. She was a grandmotherly woman from my grandfather's village, a relative of a relative. Her children had played with my dad and his siblings on summer trips growing up, and now her grandchildren would be my hosts, the gateway to local life for teenagers on the island. Hola, obrigada, sim, now say hello, thank you, I don't know. I mumbled these over and over through carefully constructed smiles and shrugs. I was alone with strangers, thousands of miles away from my home. And yet this foreign place was filled with sounds and smells and images that had a secondhand sort of intimacy. There's the harbor that my great grandfather helped build. There's the arched gates of the city, the statue of St. Michael, the archangel, namesake of the islands. The pots of beans and soup simmering on stoves, the whitewashed buildings and lava stone walls, the smell of baking bread polluting the morning air. Fresh popsique hiding in towel covered baskets on every table. 
I knew these things from my home, from relatives' homes, and yellowing pictures hung on walls. But this packaging was fresh and vibrant, and I could touch it all. My feet could move from smooth cobblestones to shifting sand, and the smell of bread now mingled with salty Atlantic air. Why would anyone ever leave this place? I too was transformed into something fresh and vibrant on that trip. At home, I was a fairly ordinary teen, always eclipsed by the beauty of an older sister and mother who looked a lot like the Barbie dolls I had once played with. I looked more like my grandmothers than the models on the covers of the fashion magazines that littered my bedroom floor. But Azorian teens found me fascinating and glamorous in my American clothes. They loved my accent and wanted to practice their English with me, saving the embarrassment of stumbling through my very limited Portuguese. They wanted to know if I had been to Hollywood, if I had ever seen a celebrity, if I knew any of the musicians they watched on MTV. The six weeks I stayed with my grandparents gave me a sense of freedom and ease that had been largely absent from life at home in the land of the free. In the Azores, 16 year olds went to discos and beaches and drank at bars and smoked cigarettes bought from vending machines and danced with beautiful strangers at moonlit concerts. They watched the sun rise and ordered espresso and pastries straight from cafe ovens at dawn they did not have to beg older sisters for rides into town. They walked or hitchhiked and didn't get murdered and thrown in a ditch. They didn't even go to church on Sundays unless it was a special occasion and their of all insisted. And music festivals were the only festas that they were interested in. The isolation of lush islands in the middle of an ocean seemed minor compared to the isolation of a 50 acre ranch in the middle of nowhere. Days on the island were for long lunches with relatives, naps on the beach, body surfing in the ocean, and tours of the corners of the world my family had once occupied. I can still hear my abu's voice narrating the passing scenes. There's the house my parents built when they came back from the States. There's the church where we were married. This is the cemetery where we buried my parents and our firstborn child. I remember marigolds and simple stone markers that distinguished one plot from the next. Avu, what does sadad mean? I look over at the many gravestones that have the word carved out in perfect block lettering. Uh, let's see, there's not an exact translation like missing and loving someone, something, someplace, like a feeling. He taps his chest and shuffles through translations in his head, a feeling between love and longing. I remember the way the ocean surrounded us in that small church graveyard, overgrown with green moss and mourning, waves embracing the rocky cliffs that guarded all the memories that couldn't stay buried beneath that volcanic soil. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda. That was lovely. Um, and I love the little line about not ending up in a ditch. I love your sense of humor. <laughs> um, okay, so our next and final reader before we get to the Q&A portion of the evening is Sam Pereira. He graduated from Fresno State in 1971 and went on to get his MFA from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. Sam is the author of seven books, most recently True North and Untrue You, which came out a few months ago with Nine Mile Press. Sam has called poetry his true north and uses it as a medium to delve into his own identity, ancestry, and place in the world. 
as he works toward his sense of truth, he creates a constellation of characters and places alive on the page, taking readers to the sea, through the darkness and fog of the Central Valley, and into family histories. Stories of a grandmother, a father, two young boys playing war in the yard. Every image evoked becoming connective tissue between past, present, and future. Please join me in welcoming Sam Pereira. Thank you, Marissa, very much. Um, I've been going back and forth as far as what I wanted to include tonight. And this is, um, after some shuffling around, this is what I've come up with. And I'm the kind of reader that has to explain a little bit about the poem. I, I can't do much in uh, the limited amount of time, but I am going to take a little time to explain as I go. The first poem is called Recalling the Animals, and it's from the new book. And uh, by the way, I got it. that's the new book. <laughs> I feel so cheap. Anyway, it's called Recalling the Animals, and it, it goes through a list of animals that were pets of mine. Uh, so this is a very sort of mild uh, poem to begin things. The sheepdog from childhood who had the soul of a hunter and was loved in spite of his chains. The gray cat who would drool on your pillow in the morning because your mother thought it was a clever way to get you out of bed and into the kitchen. The goddamn chihuahua who hated you almost as much as you hated her, but in a mysterious chihuahua kind of way. The yellow cat Jeffrey named after Smart's cat, who one day jumped to his death just to get away from the isolation you left him with each day as you traipsed off to work. Your current animal, who is not an animal at all, but your boy, wanting to walk along the old path with you, headed in the direction of the lake, with its countless rainbows of trout. And I should say that the boy is actually a dog. <laughs> that seemed, as I was reading it, that it might be a little unclear. Um, several years ago, I think it was around 2017 or so, uh, I'm not sure, though, of the dates. Borders Bookstore was closing. And uh, when I heard that um, Fresno had a Borders, and I wanted to go see quickly if I could find uh, some jazz CDs, because they also had, you know, uh, recordings. And in particular, I was looking for something from uh, Sonny, Sonny Rollins, great uh, jazz saxophonist from decades, like six or seven decades worth. Um, when I got to the store, I found that the um, CD section was pretty much picked over already. There was nothing left, really. And they had plenty of books. Nobody was buying books, but the CDs were pretty much gone. So this is a poem called Looking for Sonny Rollins and What Used to Be a Bookstore. And um, there are some references here to people that you will probably figure out. Consider the time frame. If every saxophone solo I've ever almost heard in my long night walks past the seediest liquor stores in town 
was ever to hit that one long note on the tip of Sonny's tongue ever again, well, then I'd have to cry, I suppose, and fist bump him and order two gins neat from the bar upstairs, then bob and weave back to the old wooden dance floor downstairs, holding on to someone equally alone. Both of us following the music into the darkest corners, then and only then realizing no one on Pennsylvania and whatever the cross street leads to Vladivostok or what or wherever Russians go these days. Newly returned from Tokyo, all of them waiting for that long lost note that initiates good times, along with the expected somber kisses from the proletariat Johns, because nothing truly cleanses like American jazz right in the middle of a madman's reign. Gee, who could he be talking about? This uh, next poem um, is called Approaching Afterlife. And it's a question that I suppose almost everybody if they're really being honest with themselves, has to uh, deal with at some point in their lives, maybe throughout their lives. So again, approaching afterlife becomes a momentary um, exploration, I suppose, of that possibility. <clears throat> it was always that afterlife thing that got in the way of breathing. Tail spins happen and then a truly honest man moves on. I say this not to enrage the couple just back from worshiping at the church of St. Christina, the astonishing, that little known home of prayer for the insane away from home. I am invested in your hope. It's just that every night when I turn off the TV and deprogram from the dilemma of satellites, I look out my window into the darkness and there is always some 757 flying directly over the field west of here. Everyone up there is no doubt mumbling a silent prayer while dipping their swizzle sticks casually up against their ears. The pain must be like nothing they have ever experienced in their entire flying lives. I wonder about the afterlife right about then, how it got away from us and just how soon new routes will reach our silver phones. Fernand Pessoa, is probably the second best known uh, Portuguese poet in the world, Camões being the first. Um, in many of my poems, especially in the last year or two, I've, I've had a tendency to try to include um, the presence of Pessoa in my poems with me, doing things together. Um, which is sort of a Pessoa thing to do in some ways because he had, many of his work was done 
using what he referred to as heteronyms, uh, other persona. So in this case, this is one where Fernand and I are sharing a Thanksgiving together, at least on paper, okay? And it's dedicated to a gentleman named George Montero, who for years was a, a very esteemed, renowned professor of English at Brown University. And George and I, through the internet, uh, became acquainted with each other's work. And he was always a great support along the way. Um, this is called Thanksgiving with Pessoa for George Montero. I have taken the Cornish hens from the freezer to thaw for the next two days. They will converge in the fridge with the eggs and yesterday's soup. I sometimes think this by the fire. What if Pessoa had been a bird? I also find, it's, find a strange connection to him and anyone of his nefarious heteronyms at once. Then comes the ultimate creative chess move. I wonder if either myself or the great and mysterious Pessoa alone could settle for taking up residence in a box along with the eggs, along with the soup, when our blood goes on telling us there are fish out there with our names on them. All the great tuna live in Mallorca now, which leaves us sardines and a random octopus. Fernand's been dead forever. So too, each of his somber guys went with him which leaves me, which also kept a tr who also kept a trunk filled with the scandalous correspondences and photos of old lovers, those who were and never were old lovers from the past. It was a black trunk with brass straps all around. It smelled dank as though the Atlantic had come to rest in the basement back in the 90s? Or was the smell that of Melville's whale, steeped in literature and threat, throwing itself against the door to tell me it had been aware for years? I was just the shadow of Pessoa's hat an interloper, and a would-be heir to Lisboa's big blue sea. Now, those poems are from the book. What I'd like to do, um, now is read a few poems that have happened since the book. And in fact, the next one I wanna read was written in uh, January or February, early in the year. And um, it goes back, I, I posted a picture on uh, Facebook a couple of days ago of me and Philip Levine, um, I used to go and visit Phil on occasion, and he was always um, a lovely host, uh, genuinely cared about what I had to say, which was usually not a whole lot. Um, and one particular Saturday, I showed up there, and uh, I had just gotten a new car, a Dodge Challenger. And Phil, who had, as most of you know, a connection to uh, the Detroit auto industry 
worked there for a while, um, insisted on taking the car out for a drive. He wanted to drive it. And it was a four-speed uh, car. So I said, okay, I got to go to the liquor store. Why don't, why don't you drive it and we'll go to the liquor store? And that's where this poem comes from. We were also sitting in his house uh, visiting, and this is before we went out in the car, and um, watching a boxing match. We were both uh, boxing fans. So that's a lot of the stuff that's going on here, but it's really about paying tribute to somebody who uh, I suppose I never got to, to say thank you enough to. In the 80s, watching boxing with Levine. I'm reminded that today he would have been 93. He would have woken up and kissed his wife. Maybe he would have shaken his head at the cat who left decades before him. Maybe he'd have turned back to where it all had started, where the clarity had been invested somewhere on the Detroit side of Windsor. Maybe we took the drive to the liquor store in the rain because I just wanted to buy a bottle of grief to call my own before I drove back home in the rain. Or maybe he just wanted me to see how a poet drives a stick second to third to fourth. And it sounds the way it did coming off the line in the early 50s. Nothing is automatic, Sam, he might have said, but didn't. Nothing is meant to rhyme until you're ready for it. And sometimes you're never ready. Earlier, we'd talked about fighters who had died in the ring and in life. I remember I smoked and drank. He shook his head in what seemed a complicated misgiving. I didn't see it coming then. The world was full of shit and it was always glorious to think that over drinks, everything was going to change by dinner. Now, I understand that there's a scholarship at Fresno State in the name of Larry Levis. This is a poem. Um, it's largely fictional, but Larry and I and other people, uh, David St. John, Ernesto Trejo, um, were all together, not just at Fresno, but also later at the University of Iowa uh, in the writer's workshop. And this is a poem that basically takes place in Iowa City. It's not all to be taken um, literally, but there's a certain amount of truth to it. It's called Nine Ball with the Gifted for Larry Levis. We were all just sitting around talking and your name came up out of the blue. You know, the way the old Audi might pull up on this staggering old drunk, a staggering young drunk, truth be told. You'd watch as I'd trip on a shoelace falling. How would the gifted put it? into some well-placed gutter of literature. You'd say, where are you going? Hop inside. We're on our way to Dave's to shoot a little nine ball. Get inside. Let's go. 
for 25 years. We've refused to watch you drive away. Presumably at peace, presumably in control of whatever that stunning darkness was. We wanted you awake in the middle of some dusty valley town, sleeves rolled up, flaring to soliloquy, wagging your head at these feeble chagrins and shakes. The town's Van Zandt of keyboards had keyboards been allowed to be guitars. And for those of you that aren't aware, Towns Van Zandt was a very uh, prolific and beautiful singer of songs and uh, also died too young. A couple more, if you'll bear with me. Um, getting back to the Portuguese side of things just for a minute. I struggle and I think, I think it's true of, um, of um, Melinda and also Callie uh, and anybody who has ties to both places. Um, and sometimes I don't know how to deal with both places. Sometimes they come together in a poem, uh, sometimes by plan and sometimes like this one, they just kind of happen. I'm assuming everybody out there knows Willie Nelson and his music. I'm assuming also that Willie has no Portuguese uh, in his ancestry. So how could that possibly work? Well, I imagine Willie, Willie Nelson doing a tour and going to Terceira, one of the Azor Islands. And uh, he was performing in this poem from uh, a couple of very early albums in his career. It goes back to the seventies actually. And uh, there's mention in the poem of a song called Stardust, very famous standard song uh, that Willie uh, sang along with many other standards, many other classic songs on the album Stardust. There's also mention at the end of the poem of Lapish. Uh, Lapish are a I guess the best way to describe them is sort of in between a clam and, a, and mussels. Um, and some people like them very much and some people say they taste like rubber. And I say it all depends on what you're doing with them. This is called When Willie Toured Terceda. Willie Nelson was singing red-headed stranger in the floating amphitheater that was the coast of Terceda. She walked in with her green eyes and slit skirt and her own red hair piled high on that head. Oh, that head. Everyone was smoking. Everyone was looking out at the troubled sea almost smiling again as though they had never seen joy before. St. Willie helped us see the internal, internal combustion of the waves in our glances. Whether American or otherwise, we all had a nicely aged port along with some Cage St. George, Willie sang us his Texas blues, this in a place distilled in seascape, in ways everyone had longed for. Willie sang the country out of it. And as the story continues to be told, Stardust met Lapish that night.
I want to finish, close with um, a love poem. Um, I don't think there's much else that needs to be said about it. So let me just read it. It's called The Science and a Kiss. Yesterday, frying up some eggs, waiting for her to join him in their ritualistic morning talks, climate change, and how it all related to combat love on a Tuscan terrace in the sun, or in the middle of that rare occasion when clouds gave off steam, reminiscent of pancake batter. The rain, such as it was back then, caused them both to whimper. He called her his glass of cranberry. She toyed with his old fingers, believing everyone should live like this in capable buildings with elevators to the sky and to midnight. They stared at the trees thinking about the moisture in the wilderness, about the lightly buttered eggs caught running down plastic plates in the unguent sweat of June. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much, Sam. That was wonderful. Um, I loved everything that you read and the tributes especially really hit me and those were very lovely. Thank you for sharing those. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, so if anyone in the audience has any questions that you'd like to ask the readers, just put them in the chat and then we'll be on the lookout for those. Um, and then to start off the q and I have a question that I would like all of our readers to answer um, and I'll just direct it toward Sam first. Um, so, I am just wondering how you um, got into writing about your ancestry and your heritage and like kind of what inspired that. Um, I read that um, you were in an interview, you were talking a lot about your grandmother. Um, so I'm wondering if she played a role in it at all. Oh yeah, very much. Um, when I was growing up, my, both my parents worked. So we spent a lot of time after school uh, at my grandmother's house. And my grandmother spoke no, uh, spoke a lot of Portuguese, no English at all. So it was always interesting. Um, we would go in and uh, she would give us Coke, Coca-Cola and um, Portuguese sweet bread. And everybody had, you know, early versions of television sets then. And we would sit down and watch a show that came on in the afternoon every day called American Bandstand. And she would stand there watching as everybody on the show danced to basic rock and roll songs. And she had her rosary. She was pretty old then and she was bent over. And she would just stand there watching these kids dance and she would giggle. And, you know, a giggle doesn't need to be translated. So um, she, she played a huge part. In fact, the cover of my first book is uh, um, a drawing that was designed to sort of uh, picture the artist's conception of what uh, this woman looked like. Um, yeah, she was quite special, quite special. I love that. Um, 
I I have so many questions there that I could ask, but um, I want to give Melinda and Callie a chance to answer this one too. Um, so let's go to Melinda. Um, what inspired you to start writing about your heritage? Um, well, I I think in my writing, I explore a lot of cultural rituals. And I think as with most um, people who grow up as children or grandchildren of immigrants, um, you always feel like you're not quite fully American, but you're not quite fully whatever, wherever your family comes from either. So it's like your whole life, you're working to build this bridge across to make it all make sense within your identity. So um, that's how I started, I think, exploring it more. And of course, just um, writing about family and writing about growing up in the Valley. It, it is all so intermingled. Uh, it was impossible to not write about it. Yeah, um, I totally relate. I'm not Portuguese, I'm Mexican American, um, but yeah, I feel that very much. Um, so writing like becoming its own space sort of um, that exists in between, yeah. Um, Callie, what about you? How did you get into exploring your ancestry and heritage and those themes? I think for me, it's more of a journey of rediscovery than anything else. Um, my, I'm fourth generation here. Uh, my great grandfather in that generation were the ones to come over. So in my family, my generation is the point where we have kind of grown up without as much of that cultural background. My father, my, my grandfather could speak fluent Portuguese. My father knew a couple words when he was young and they have mostly left him at this point. So for me, there's a real fascination with what would it have been like if I had had more of that as a child? What if I had learned Portuguese as a second language? What if I had participated in festivities more often? So for me, it's really finding those connections in my own upbringing and the stories that I have been told by family members and um, exploring that in my writing. Rediscovery, yes, I love that. Um, thank you for those answers, you guys. Um, there's a really interesting question here in the chat that popped up. Um, so I will just read it. Um, it said it's from Janet C.M. Eldred. And it says, it strikes me that being a Portuguese American writer entails a preoccupation with places and homes and displacement. And going from little towns in the valley to the academy is also a kind of displacement. I can't imagine, for example, what it was like for Sam to go to Iowa and to that high profile workshop. And I wonder for Callie and Melinda, does the academy feel like home or a dis or displacement? Um, so Melinda, do you wanna take that first? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say initially definitely going from a small town to, um, the academy or the first big university that I attended felt like a complete displacement. And in some ways I struggled with um, feeling like I was betraying the, uh, the background that I came from or, you know, just because it's such a different world. So I guess in some ways um, writing about that, that transition and writing about moving between worlds is something that helped me um, make peace with it, perhaps. And now definitely in, in at Fresno State and especially within the creative writing community, it, it completely feels like home. So, yeah. Um, what about you, Kelly? Does it feel like home or displacement? Um, I think for me, at least I, 
have kind of stayed in the same area. So I think there's been a bit of a broadening of my perspective um, about the world, but for the most part, I feel as though I found a home in the academy just through finding a space to explore and share my ideas. Um, and I wanna extend this question to Sam too, um, because you just retired recently from teaching as well, right? So does the academy um, feel like home to you or did you feel displacement at all? You know, I've been uh, all over the place with that whole thing. I mean, I, I lived in a small town initially. I live in a small town now. I taught for 20 plus years in a small town. The town is Los Banos. Um, when I came to Fresno, it was, uh, you know, I was like 18 years old and it was eye-opening and Fresno wasn't nearly the size that it is today, but it was way bigger than Los Banos. And when I went to Iowa City, um, Iowa City was a whole different ball game. Uh, I had to get used to snow for one thing. The academy in Iowa City was, you know, I, I was in the writer's workshop. So I, I wasn't like in a PhD program somewhere. We were told to take the time and write our asses off. And that's what we did. And there was a lot of that time spent um, just learning about life, which is what this writing comes to in the end. Um, sometimes at great cost, but it's still part of the deal. I taught uh, junior high school. Initially, when I went to Fresno, I got a teaching credential and uh, I never used it for a long time. Uh, I won't bore you with the story, but it's, you know, it's different. But when I finally did get back to teaching, uh, I found a whole different set of things to deal with. Uh, 12 and 13 year old kids, for one thing. <laughs> and that took a while to get used to. And uh, when I retired, I missed it. I still miss it on occasion. So, you know, it's a mishmash of a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then I have a follow-up question for you all. Um, are you all first generation um, college students or no? I am. Okay. Okay. Um, because I'm wondering, so I'm first gen in my family. Um, and so like college and the academy is a weird time with, you know, the idea of home and displacement. But I'm thinking too, just as um, writers and creatives and like pursuing that, what that relationship look like for you guys. Um, Sam, for you as like a first gen, um, how you navigated that. The idea of going going to college? Um, no, just like pursuing your writing. Um, oh. Because like for me, it's like, I don't know what your experience was like, but um, <laughs> there's a pressure to like go to a university and like get a job and make money That's and right. build a life, you know, but yeah. writing doesn't. How much money are you that. gonna earn? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, yeah, you bet it was a problem. Uh, until my dad saw the first book. And then money was never an issue again. You know, I can still see the pride in his in his uh, face. He'd never admit it, but I mean, it, it was there. Um, yeah, yeah, it was it was a, a tough sell. 
uh, I mean, I was going to college to get a teaching credential. That was my, you know, my ace in the hole kind of. But after the first year of college, I was there to write. You know, that's why I was there. I was part of the English department. I knew what I wanted to do. There was no doubt in my mind, but I had to convince other people along the way that what I was doing was right and that it wasn't about, you know, piling up a bunch of money. It would be nice, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, Callie and Melinda, did you want to speak on that question at all? Sure. I actually touched on this. I did an interview earlier in the week with um, Dennis Borges. Uh, and yes, I, I'm kind of a first generation. My grandmother was a teacher. So she, when they came to this country, she had already been a teacher, but um, she had to get her teaching credential here. So she went to Humboldt State University. Um, and so, I, but my parents, my mother went to like business college, but not a four-year university. So it wasn't, it was a new world. Um, and, and also I struggled with, with the practicality of a career in arts, you know, your whole life you hear, um, you know, there's a lot of starving artists or whatever. So that's not even really like, that's something you do at the end of your life after you've lived and worked. Right. So that's why it took me so long to come back around to it and, and to find um, a happy medium by pursuing both teaching and writing. Uh, but I think also that um, for me and for my generation, you know, we never had to worry about um, food on the table or, um, you know, good quality medical care or, you know, being able to go to school every day. So I feel privileged to look at the arts and see that it is not only practical, but it is necessary and um, a vital part of, of life. Um, Callie, was there anything that you wanted to address with that question? So full disclosure, I'm not a first generation student. So I can't speak to that experience. And I don't think I could have said anything better than what Melissa just said, or um, excuse me, Linda just said. Um, but as, as when I entered college, I was a mechanical engineering major because I did not think that um, as much as I loved reading and writing, I was very much of the mindset that like, that is a starving artist pursuit. But um, I made the decision shortly after starting college um, to switch to an English major and pursue that because I couldn't see myself pursuing a degree in construction and architecture and that sort of field. And um, there was a lot of fear at first. I definitely had um, I knew what concerned my parents greatly. Uh, they would never admit it to me, but I know that my mom definitely cried when I first told her in private. So I, I've seen the stigma that surrounds the arts and the idea that it's not a sustainable pursuit, but like Melinda and Sam said, it's a necessary art so um there is another question that popped up here in the chat from millicent um and it says for everyone um what do you think are the major themes or touchstones of russo literature um and i will let's start with Sam on that one. Are we talking, um, for me, uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, it is family, um, water, the ocean, um, 
to a certain extent, pro or con, religion is going to come into it. Again, if you're being open and honest about it. And I, I, I want to say something here that I, I've never, I don't think I've said before. When I started writing poetry that had something connected to being Portuguese American, I was hesitant at first because I had this idea of what, you know, a Portuguese American thinks. And you know what? They think just like everybody else. They have lots of opinions and they don't live in a church 24 seven, but that's where I was coming from. Uh, so yeah, those things are incredibly strong and necessary uh, and they're there, you know, I can't, I can't get rid of them anyway, but they do play a huge part in that type of writing. Um, and Melinda and Kelly, are there any other things that you guys would add to that? I mean, I think Sam covered some of the major themes that I have personally encountered in Lusso literature. Um, I would say, especially when speaking of Azorian literature, you have, uh, you also have like themes of um, persistence, um, themes of, uh, what am I trying to say? Persistence, um, I would say almost like kind of anti-establishment a little bit because the Azores, you know, they were always um, kind of, you know, they weren't the mainland and they were a mixture of all these different cultures and um, and sailors and settlers. So yeah, so a lot, a lot of fun themes, but I'm, I'm always encountering new things every time I read them. Um, we are starting to run short on time here. Um, so I am just going to ask um, one last question for Sam about your new book. Um, what, was there anything particularly exciting or surprising that came up while you were writing it and putting it together? The book was largely put together uh, during the years between 2016 and 2020. So initially, the initial manuscript was far more political than it ended up being, but there are still political aspects. I read one or two things that if, you know, if you caught it, uh, it, was, it was a very big deal. And you guys know that too. And there was no getting away from it. So, you know, like it or not, the politics of the time entered into the, the poetry a lot. Um, the book was initially going to be called um, The Recent Coup. And I decided to get rid of a whole lot of stuff and, and re redo a lot of stuff. And the theme changed when I did that. And it was probably one of the smartest things I ever did. It doesn't mean that my, my political feelings are any different. They're there, they're gonna stay there, but um, it was, it was an interesting book to write. Yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to read your book. And um, there is a link for everyone where you can get a copy of Sam's newest book. And he's holding it up for you there. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank all of our readers one more time before we go. It was lovely to hear you and thank you for sharing your words with all of us tonight. And um, we have 
two more readings happening this summer um, that you guys can come to. The first one is on July 1st um, with Ashley Wells and Charles Radke. And the second one is August 5th with David Campos and Maceo Montoya. And I hope to see you guys all there. Have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you.